this meeting. So a warm welcome to everyone. This is uh, an open session entitled Making Sustainability Central in Design. And um, this session is part of Pratt Earth Action Week. So we have a, a week packed with amazing, really meaningful um, Zoom open sessions as well and, and, and various events. Um, so if anyone does not have the link for that, you can let us know and one of us will just post a link in the chat room. Um, so I will be introducing our uh, presenters in a moment. Um, let me just say that in general, all um, three main presenters are program faculty from the Sustainable Design Certificate Program at Pratt, um, the School of Continuing and Professional Studies. Uh, my name is Joelle Dannant, as you can see on my screen, and um, I'm the program director for this program, among other programs. Um, and, um, and Tetsu Ohara is the academic consultant uh, for this program, and as well as one of the faculty members. And so we, by the way, also have a graduate uh, for someone who graduated from our certificate program, Julia Briere. We're very happy that uh, Julia is with us today. She can share briefly her own story around sustainable design. Um, so we're, we're going to um, enjoy sharing a thoughtful conversation on this theme of how to make sustainability central in design. And this is the main question that's going to inspire uh, you know, everyone, uh, starting with our uh, three presenters and then with Julia. So let me not delay in, um, by the way, questions are welcome at any time. And so the way to do this, you can feel free to, oh, I see the chat room already has two messages in them. So let me, oh, thank you so much, Carolyn. Wonderful. Okay. So we now have the link available for the Pratt Earth Action Week, thanks to Carolyn. Um, I was going to say that regarding questions or comments, because this is a, an exchange, a conversation, please feel free at any time to post your questions or comments. Um, my suggestion is that you please begin in the chat room, uh, particularly when the presenters are sharing their own uh, you know, thoughts and perspectives on this. And, you know, and, and when they're done, then we can open it up even more, at which time we can even do this live, okay? And uh, maybe because there are many of us, you can perhaps just raise your hand, either your physical or your iconic hand, and that'll be perfect. So let me now introduce our uh, wonderful speakers. So let me begin with Tetsu. So Tetsuo Hara is an adjunct associate professor and departmental sustainability coordinator in the School of Design at Pratt Institute. So Tetsu's commitment to integrating smart design, meaning with sustainable solutions as part of the design proposal, has resulted in exceptional graduate students' works since 2007. Tetsu teaches qualifying level core design studio and interior options lab in sustainability and biomimicry. Tetsu also leads the Pratt Sustainability Coalition in order to organize the annual Pratt Earth Action Week. It's a campus-wide event uh, that you're going to um, experience hopefully for the rest of this week. Tetsu has recently received the Positive Impact Award under the Leadership in Sustainable Design Education category uh, from the former Brooklyn Fashion and Design Accelerator. And this led Tetsu to the academic consultant and teaching opportunity for Pratt SCPS, New Sustainable Design Certificate Program, uh, which is this program that everyone um, who is going to present is part of. With an architectural degree from the College of Environmental Design at UH, I'm sorry, uh, the bio here looks strange. I apologize to Tetsu, but there's a typo on the bio. Um, anyway, 
So Tetsu leads the Pratt Sustainability Coalition in order to organize... Oh, sorry, there's... Anyway, through his work, Tetsu has recently... You know, something is wrong here. Um, ta -da -da. Okay, so Tetsu is also a partner at Spatial Design Studio, Inc., practicing interior architecture in Asia, Europe, and the U.S., and this office integrates green design in each project whenever possible. All right. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce the other presenters now so that we can enter the conversation uh, right, right afterwards. Then we have Kat Choate. And Kat is a visiting assistant professor for Pratt SEPS Sustainable Design Certificate Program and works as a visualizer for night nurse images assisting other designers in expressing ideas to clients and collaborators. They are a Pratt alum with a degree in architecture and a minor in sustainability studies. Their personal work investigates the increasingly ambiguous boundaries between the built and natural environment toward a, a future of design and meshed with ecology. And then we have Danielle Pange, who is also who is a visiting instructor for Pratt um, SEPS Sustainable Design Certificate Program and serves as a materials research specialist at Material Bank, where Dan aids interior designers and architects in specifying materials for their building projects. Dan is a Pratt alum with a degree in industrial design and a focus in sustainability. After completing a year-long fellowship, Dan was recently granted the title of Circular Economy Pioneer from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So now let me just briefly introduce Julia as well. Julia Briere um, completed the uh, Sustainable Design Certificate program in the spring of last year. And it took Julia from September 2019 until May 2020 to complete that program. And right afterwards, uh, Julia was admitted into several uh, um, degree programs, including at the Harvard Graduate School of Design in Design Studies, at the University College uh, London Biointegrated Design, Royal College of Art in Art Design uh, Diploma, and the Royal College of Art in Information Experience Design, and also at Central St. Martins in Biodesign. And prior to taking this certificate program, uh, Julia graduated uh, in a bachelor's and a BA in Culture and Media with a minor in Photography from the new school, Eugene Lang, uh, at Eugene Lang. And um, after graduating from the new school, Julia worked as a photographer and videographer. So this was Julia's life before she embarked on our Sustainable Design Certificate program. We'll hear from her about uh, her story thereafter. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to let our next speaker present. Let's see now. I need to... Okay, we're starting with Tetsu. Thank you, Tetsu. Well, thank you, Joelle. Um, hi, my name is Tetsu Ohara, and I'll be well. There will be a professional segment and academic segments to this uh, sets of um, uh, sharing. Um, so I'll be brief with the professional side first, uh, followed by the other two presenters. Um, I typically don't use the word sustainability with my client. Um, because it should be embedded within the practice. And I have been creating a uh, practice that uh, makes sustainability central in design to begin with for all my life, ever since I uh, graduated from College of Environmental Design, UC Berkeley and other places. And what I do ask though, is that I ask the site as an interior designer people might think that I look for something from inside out, but actually I do ask the site from the outside in. In a way, um, of course, everybody uh, analyzes a site, but 
And for me, I'm interested in the climate. I'm interested in the topography. I'm interested in the daylighting, the surrounding noise control, the air quality, the water quality of the site. And all these things would then lead to an inside out approach from the interior design point of view, where we start um, incorporating life cycle analysis, uh, human wellness, uh, quality of life conversation, and of course, local and reclaimed materials and energy efficiency. So you can see some of the images there, they might not be obvious to it, but we have put a lot of uh, efforts into creating those kind of environmental awareness embedded and sometimes invisible in, in, in our uh, design practice. Season is important, asking the nature about what it is the site that we're working with is a critical thing what we do. And that's how we uh, strategize in sustainability central design um, approach for me. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Kat Choate. Uh, as Joelle mentioned at my day job, my title is visualizer. So that means that I help other designers to express their ideas. Um, a big part of design is being able to communicate your vision to other people. Um, I actually started out working at a small architecture firm and that was one of the more difficult aspects of what we were trying to do, right? I think that a lot of people tend to associate sustainability with austerity and sacrifice and extra costs uh, to work harder to lessen your impact. But in fact, I really think that a sustainable future can be centered around um, beauty and balance and joy and all of these benefits that we can all enjoy. So being able to communicate that idea has been very important to me and I'm really happy to be able to help uh, designers to do that and to help empower our students to do that as well, uh, to express their own design ideas. Um, outside of that, I do a lot of speculative design work. Um, a lot of that is about visualizing what sustainable futures can look like. Um, you'll notice that some of that is cited in space, and that's not because I'm interested in colonizing other planets. I like Earth, but I think that a lot of the research that is coming out of what it would look like for uh, humans to live in more inhospitable environments really serves to highlight the fact that we can't survive without other species, uh, which I think is really important to remember. You know, we have evolved alongside of all of these other members of our ecosystem. And I think we kind of take for granted their part in our lives as well. Uh, when I design, I'm really focused on relationships rather than things. And I think that that helps to illuminate uh, possibilities to uh, better integrate ourselves with our ecology. For example, right now I'm looking at sustainable futures imagining uh, not seawalls in cities, but perhaps saltwater urban estuaries and what it could look like to live uh, in an ecology like that. Hi everybody, thanks Joelle for the intro. Uh, my name is Dan Penji. Um, as mentioned, I have a background in industrial design. Uh, some of my professional experience includes designing furniture, uh, products, packaging. Uh, but my current nine to five role is as a material research specialist at Material Bank. Uh, where my role is really to, to gather and communicate performance data. Um, I act as kind of a liaison between manufacturers and designers, um, uh, of course, alongside uh, a, a team uh, where we basically, we have to maintain the world's largest material database for the uh, architecture and design community. Uh, by moonlight, my time is dedicated to Pratt uh, as an in visiting instructor in this program. I also teach in the furniture design certificate program. Much of my personal work uh, really focuses on one sort of sustainability school of thought, which is the circular, um, the circular economy. I recently just uh, finished a year long fellowship with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, uh, where I spent time looking how we can maybe instead of designing products or rather than, rather than the, the solution being a thing how can we look at systems? How can we look at a real user needs and um, come up with solutions that uh, are, are a little bit 
different than, than what's expected of a traditional industrial designer. So, um, you know, I'm really, I'm really excited about, um, you know, teaching in this program because so much of what we do is help students to action on their learning. So um, hopefully if, if those, those of you join us, you know, um, uh, we, can, we can offer that benefit to you as well. I did want to talk a little bit about our students quickly. So our students, our students come from a variety of backgrounds uh, and with very varying ambitions. Uh, program is unique in that it is, is it's, it's discipline agnostic. Um, students can pursue basically any type of design. We've taught working professionals with um, engineering, advertising, UX design, jewelry design, fine arts experience, you know, just to, just to list a few. What we like to do is start off class by learning about our students um, and assess their existing knowledge. We, we, we strongly believe that their past studies and experiences are an important asset, um, both to any future design endeavors they may pursue, but also to other students in the classroom that they can learn from. Uh, of course, this presents an interesting, ever-evolving, but fun challenge for uh, Tetsu Kat and I. Um, but we really care about student comfort in our courses. We found that they perform better when they're able to easily engage with us and each other. Um, and so we take time to make sure that the course is structured um, in a way that allows us to tailor it to each individual. Um, and, you know, we, we make sure to establish relationships with um, students uh, that makes the, it, it a fun environment. Uh, and many of the students we keep in touch with, um, like Julia here. So. I wanna give uh, Julia some space to talk a little bit about her experience and, and decision in enrolling. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Julia and thank you Dan for the intro. Um, a little bit about me and my background is I started in photography and film and I um, took some time off because of an injury and I was kind of inching to try something new and possibly do a career change. And um, I was looking for courses to take and I decided to enroll in this program uh, for a few different reasons. One was sustainability is a topical subject. And after reading the course descriptions, I kind of realized that I didn't know what sustainability actually was. And um, I became really curious about that. And I felt it was really in line with values that I would like to bring into my practice. Um, the second one was I didn't have a design background and the program would allow me to um, explore different pathways. So I was able to explore, you know, I experimented with biomaterials. Um, I did some product design. I re redesigned um, an urban uh, structure that was in the urban environment. Um, so there's really a lot of room to play and to tailor uh, what you want to do. Um, it was also continuing education was a really great way to um, build a community and a network. And my cohort, um, we were a bit of an anomaly because we um, started in person and shifted to virtual. So of course there are benefits to learning um, in person, but the shift to virtual, um, there was still, a, you know, we there was still like, I felt like it was fostering a community and we were able to still connect. And it was kind of nice not to actually have uh, a long commute and you could, you know, take the class from your home. Um, and just to speak a little bit about outcomes, um, a major one for me was I was able to build a portfolio and that allowed me to pursue a master's. Um, it's also a really great way to springboard um, or have it as a springboard for career opportunities. Um, just the knowledge base is an advantage to have in either your personal practice or whether you're bringing it back to a company or, um, or a company you're already working at. Um, and the curriculum is fun and it's a, just a really great opportunity to create work around topics you really care about. and. and um, things you're past, passionate about changing. Um, that's a little bit about me and I'm happy to answer any questions um, after the presentation. Thank you, Julia. So let's talk a little bit about the classes and the program itself. 
And I see that there are some questions coming in. We will answer all questions at the end. Um, so please just uh, be patient. Um, so Sustainable Design Foundation is the sole prerequisite course in the program. Um, it is, once that class has been completed, students can enroll in any of the subsequent courses and that can be done in basically any order. Um, this is one of the three courses in the program that Kat and I teach together actually. Um, in this course, we, we cover quite a bit. We start by helping um, students understand the key principles of sustainability and their origins. So, you know, I'd say in class, we're always unraveling, right? We're trying to understand core issues and ensuring that students can make those connections on their own. So, you know, much of what we're doing is, is about course correction. We help students by, identify, uh, by identifying common misconceptions. And, um, you know, students learn that design is about answering need and how to implement, um, they learn how to implement that into their own design process. Another thing we focus quite heavily on is uh, vocabulary. So we, we provide students with specific vocabulary and the know-how to use language that they are already familiar with um, uh, and use that to discuss sort of complicated considerations. Uh, there are certain words um, that are very often used, but seldom understood. As Chatsu mentioned earlier, the word sustainability itself can often be vague and easily muddled or distorted. So we, we dive a bit deeper into how to clarify those, um, those words. We also put quite a, quite a bit of emphasis on inquiry, um, which is the process of asking questions. We make sure to provide uh, criteria and framework to assess you know, how a solution can be addressed uh, Kat and I use a framework that we call a quadruple bottom line, which is essentially a deliberate analysis of people, planet, profit, and time. And we try to help everyone to understand that ultimately the goal is, is thriving balance. Um, because many of our students do not have design backgrounds, we also take the time to explore you know, design fundamentals like composition and form, uh, while also discussing narrative um, and systems thinking. You know, it's a packed class, so we really do go over a lot. But as and as Julia mentioned earlier, you know, students will leave the course um, um, with sort of enhanced research, enhanced research skills and and portfolio uh, building abilities. Uh, you know, we have a couple of examples of student work here. The the earlier example uh, was was a student who studied an existing design. Um, we, we call it a precedent called the microbial home. Um, her analysis led to uh, a proposal um, to propose, she proposed a version um, of, of this similar design suited for a system much longer, uh, larger. She, she basically fit this for an entire residential city building. And the second example we have um, is work by a student who chose to study passive house strategies and proposed a mobile option at the end of the course. As you can see here, you know we don't care. We don't care just about like pretty renders per se, um, but we, what we really want to see students do is to put their research and ideas down on paper. Um, so another course in the program that Kat and I also teach is called Sustainable Process and Materials. This course is based in complex systems thinking where we discuss the human and material relationship through a life cycle perspective uh, lens. We study common raw material extraction practices, production methods, transportation routes, externalizations, inputs and unintended consequences, just to list a, a few items. Uh, we then cover evaluative tools and design strategies so that students have the power to offer their own solutions. I think that's partly the reason why um, you know, students come to us is again, they want, they want to be actionable. Uh, students will leave the course with a better understanding of how consumer items are made and arrive in their possession. We have an example here where one student analyzed a sandal, her favorite sandal that she went uh, on many adventures with. Uh, she broke down the components uh, oftentimes we'll have students actually slice through their products so that we can do a little bit of a product autopsy. In this case, we let them be. Um, and so you see here, you know, we're looking at 
uh, raw materials, uh, production methods, manufacturing locations. And then we have another example here of a student who uh, chose to analyze a paintbrush. So her favorite paintbrush, she was an artist. And so um, she very quickly looked at the general steps it took to manufacture this object. Hi, I think that's my cue there. Um, I have two sets of um, examples, one by individual work and the other one by the team work. And I get to teach this class called biomimicry, which um, uh, in, inevitably, and it might be too, uh, too uh, um, uh, obvious, but the sustainability is everything because biomimicry design is to emulate time-tested nature's patterns and strategies and that the will trying to seek solution, uh, sustainable solutions to human challenges. And how we, um, how my class tends to um, uh, put several emphasis on these days is that the, we align with the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. So that those goals and challenges we set up first um, and then uh, we follow through the, uh, the design proposals so that the students not only get to prepare a portfolio and learn about biomimicry, but they get to be part of the uh, problem solving for, uh, for the world. In this particular individual work was more about wellness. It's about more in the interior context, wanted to uh, fresh up an air quality control um, design system by mimicking a pine cones opening and closing. It's a kinetic skin called it. Next. And this one was uh, more uh, uh, recent. Um, it was a teamwork um, done by uh, three students who looked into, this was SDG goals uh, for uh, dealing with the microplastics um, in, 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 in the, uh, uh, the river and also the ocean. We have a lot of different kinds of challenges around the world today. The climate change, the fire, the flood, the drought, earthquakes. Um, and other types of issues, social justice, gender, racial inequality, hunger, all these types of things we, we tackle. And, but the good thing is, and a wonderful thing is that we get to put our feet and understand a little bit more about the beauty of nature and things that it's being done uh, and not invented, but we're really learning and reconnecting with the nature's wisdom of 3.8 billion years. So that's a really fantastic um, opportunity for students to be able to, to learn. And it's, it's my privilege and honor to be able to teach that class. Uh, we include life cycle thinking, as of course sustainability is important, but the human challenges, and that, uh, that makes you feel good about helping the world, not from the elite, elitist point of view, but trying to provide and help uh, the weak, the poor, the needed. And so it's a really um, wonderful class. Uh, I really enjoy teaching it and students like it as well. Thank you. So uh, this semester I'm teaching the biodesign course uh, as well. I actually have some of Julia's work uh, from when she was in the course before I started teaching it here. Uh, to show you. But uh, the biodesign course, similar to the biomimicry course, is about a specific sustainable design strategy, right? So you learn about biomimicry in the biomimicry course. In the biodesign course, you learn about uh, designing with or for other living things. Uh, so that can mean a few different things. It can mean uh, using biomaterials, right? Things that are grown, using biofabrication, which means um, employing other organisms as collaborators to create materials and actually build structures. Um, there's also bioassisted design, which means that you're incorporating still living organisms within a design as part of its function. Uh, there's also biodegradation, which we're all kind of familiar with. It's, it's less so an inherent property of material than a relationship uh, between a material, uh, the organisms which will break it down and the climate in which that's facilitated, right? 
Uh, there's also bioremediation. It's the possibility of living things um, allowing materials to return to healthy cycles in the environment, right? Things like detoxifying soil and water and air um, through biological processes. Uh, so in Julia's project here, she experimented with um, using waste from avocados as a biomaterial to create uh, alternatives to plastics. Um, and you can see that she got some really beautiful results from that experiment. Um, another example is more of a bioassisted slash biofabrication design uh, by Colleen Whiteley. She was she had begun to experiment with uh, vermicomposting and worm castings as a material in a different course in the program and continued that exploration through the biodesign course uh, to actually consider the application of these casted uh, worm leavings as a way to transport compost without plastic packaging, which is a really brilliant, simple solution. Uh, but she had decided to explore that further and consider how that might uh, be applied in different environments, such as Mars in this case, right? She uh, explored the problem of um, perchlorates in the Martian regolith. And if people are going to survive there to do research and experimentation, you know, perhaps they would need to grow their own food in that environment and how we can begin to imagine, um, you know, people surviving there again in relationship with other species, which we do need, right? Uh, so another course that Dan and I teach together is Sustainable Design Theory and Practice. Uh, in this course, we really emphasize uh, giving students the opportunity to really explore their own unique design processes, right? We cover um, the basic design process in Foundation and the other courses, but here students really get to explore what design means to them and take on, you know, whatever problems, whatever strategies they find most interesting and really take a deep dive in what they would like to explore. Uh, in this example, a student, Brandon Stammen, decided to see if he could take on um, perhaps inviting uh, his neighbors to grow native species in their gardens and how to uh, begin to express some of the positive relationships that can happen when you invite these native creatures into your gardens. Um, and really explore those systems and figure out what an interspecies community can mean uh, in an urban environment. Um, I also wanted to highlight some examples of student work where uh, students decided to confront uh, the crisis of the pandemic with their designs. So I have four examples here. Uh, there are some actually kind of unexpected results of the pandemic, one of which is that the composting budget in the waste management of New York City was slashed by something like 90%. Uh, so one student decided to design a system as a transitional um, way of dealing with compost until the budget can recover. Um, another student uh, decided to expose um, what we understand as the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on uh, Black Americans as actually part of a long lineage of medical and racial abuse um, rather than an isolated incident. So it was more of an informational design uh, sort of approach. Um, other students have decided to explore um, the safety of outdoor dining structures, uh, designing a modular system to make it easier and safer for uh, restaurant staff and diners as well. And finally, another student uh, was exploring the problems of isolation and quarantine and how people can begin to deal with stress. Uh, so she designed a very simple prop uh, for restorative yoga for people who might not be familiar with how to do that, right? Keeping it as simple as possible, meeting the need of um, allowing the possibility of de-stressing in a really stressful time uh, in a very easy and accessible way. And I think that's a good segue into our theme of recover, renew, reconnect as we're kind of emerging from these crises, right? And imagining, you know, better days ahead. Uh, Joelle, I think that you're gonna lead us out. Thank you, Kat. Uh, are you able to show the next uh, series of slides? Thank you so much. This is so inspiring. Um,
So to offer a brief summary before we open it up to, um, to questions, <clears throat> we have in this uh, sustainable design certificate program, five courses. The first one is the prerequisite course, and it's the Sustainable Design Foundation, co-taught by Kat and Dan. Um, this particular course is offered every term or every semester, if you will, at the very beginning of every semester in the fall, the spring, and even the summer. I'll talk about the summer uh, in a little while. Um, the four courses are divided into, in other words, like the first two courses, you can see sustainable uh, processes and materials. Actually, yes. Um, by the way, those four courses right now are not necessarily in any sequential order. Uh, the typical scenario is that the sustainable processes and materials is typically offered in parallel to the sustainable design theory and practice course. And that's typically offered every fall semester. And the biomimicry and biodesign courses are offered in parallel to each other in the spring and also in the summer. And so anyone who's interested in this program can begin at any time, meaning whether you choose to embark in this program in the fall or in the spring or in the summer, you'd always start with the Sustainable Design Foundation. And then right afterwards, you would embark on two courses that are taught in parallel at the same time um, within that same semester. So you would typically take, if you follow the standard uh, you know, route that we're uh, offering here, um, you would typically take three courses that first semester whenever you start and then you would finish by taking the remaining two courses the following semester. Um, and so, yes, thank you, Kat. <clears throat> and so it looks like this. Beautiful. I really like that chart. So the Sustainable Design Foundation is taught twice a week in the fall and in the spring. And therefore, it's a five week course when you take it in the fall or in the spring. But in the summer, everything gets accelerated. Um, so in the summer, it's just for two weeks, but you can see that it's no longer twice a week. It becomes four times a week, Monday through Thursday. Now the courses are always in the evening. So in the fall and the spring, it's for three hours, twice a week, 6.30 to 9.30. And in the summer, um, it's three, hours and 45 minutes. Actually, we cut the last 10 minutes to honor this idea of a break every 10 minutes. Um, anyway, so that's for the two weeks in the summer. And if you look at the biomimicry course, which is typically offered in parallel with the biodesign course, and that's gonna be offered this very summer, uh, because we, the spring is too late for the spring. For this spring, it's too late. Uh, so this summer, it's going to be Monday through Thursday, four times a week from 9.30 a.m. to 1.15 p.m. Again, three hours and 45 minutes. All of this is happening online at this time through Zoom. Uh, so the same schedule goes in the summer for biomimicry and biodesign, except that um, the biodesign one is in the evening instead of the morning from 6.15 to 9.50. The sustainable processes and materials uh, will only be offered once a year in the fall, and that's for 10 weeks. So the sustainable processes and materials is on Wednesday evenings, 6.30 to 9.30, and the theory and practice is for 10 weeks on Mondays, 6.30 to 9.30. So I think this chart pretty much speaks for itself. Um, and we can also post the, um, the link to the website 
for anyone who might be interested in getting more details like course descriptions, actual, like actual dates for this summer, um, you know, little details like that. So I'll, I'll, I'll be doing that. Uh, but we, I don't have to stop. Oh yes. Thank you, Kat. It's all here. Wonderful. So sustainable design foundation is going to be available this summer from June 14th to the 24th and biomimicry will be it's actually going to be called you you just have to add the term intensive in the summer because it's accelerated um and so biomimicry this summer will be offered from july 26th to august 5th and then biodesign will be um july 12th to the 22nd and you can see the times are biomimicry always in the morning biodesign always in the evening and the foundational course always in the evening as well um so that's it i think for the overview on those details thank you so much dan um for um providing the link to the website okay so we have joseph caruso who has a question so thank you so much for your patience um, uh, Joseph, jo Joelle, do you want to put your email for those people who might have a specific questions to you as an administration? Sure. So that the people could, um, we're happy to answer any questions or discuss and chat about other things. I don't think Joseph is with us right now. Okay. Um, I see another question from Megan Day. Uh, looks like that's for me and Dan. Um, so exercises we could recommend for helping students discover their design practice or for helping them to verbalize it. Um, that's a great question. Uh, there's a few exercises we really love. Uh, one of which is kind of whimsical actually. It's drawing how to make toast. Um, and it's fun because it kind of throws everyone off and they don't expect it to be a design exercise. Uh, but we ask students to draw a set of instructions for how they would make a piece of toast. And you do a few rounds of it and people start to realize the steps that they're missing to communicate their idea. And it actually becomes a collaborative exercise by the end where people are comparing their different approaches and offering drawings and kind of, you know, combining them, putting them in different order to create a more detailed picture of what that looks like. So part of what that helps students to do is recognize how valuable other people's input is um, to figure out how things should work uh, in a design project. Uh, part of it is about kind of the unexpected things that could come out of the process. Um, and another is just to get people drawing, frankly, like people tend to be shy about drawing, but we think it's really important. Um, like Dan says, not just for drawing a pretty picture, but just to communicate your ideas uh, in general. Um, another iteration of that that's a little bit more related maybe to specific design processes is something called the double diamond model. So that involves getting students to first start by exploring the problem they would like to solve. Um, and that comes in two halves. So the first half of finding the right problem to solve is to diverge, to think of as many ideas as you possibly can for what you might like to work on. And that helps students to not get too critical and freeze up, right? If we analyze our ideas too closely or if we overthink, we might not consider all the possibilities uh, that we might approach. Um, the second step is to look at all these things that you've kind of thrown on the board, right, on your page and begin to narrow down what you would actually like to do. So once you have that narrowed down to a few options, you repeat the divergent process with finding the solution. So that's a lot of sketching. Um, we ask students to do, I think, at least 20 sketches of what they might like to uh, propose to resolve their chosen problem. Uh, and then they share that with the class and we all offer input and consider things they may not have thought of and that allows them to narrow down on what their solution might be in the end as they iterate and repeat this process and kind of refine their ideas. Let's see. Um, Nancy, would you like to speak? Uh, the 
so that this is supposed to be a conversation. So we yeah. want to encourage interactions, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I'm an assistant professor in the School of Information and I teach a sustainable interaction design course. Um, and interestingly, we actually cover a lot of the things that you've talked about here, only on a much smaller scale because we do a, a lot of this in the context of one class. Um, and students are uh, graduate students, but they their final project is actually just wide open in that I just let them develop a project of their own and I encourage them to just kind of explore something of interest. So my question was actually how to help students narrow down because I find it's really common that with sustainability, they really want to tackle like these huge issues related to climate change or climate crisis and oftentimes so many things get piled in that it ends up being sort of a an unmanageable project. And so we spend a lot of time kind of trying to think about how to focus those things. Um, so I just wondered if you had activities or thoughts about that or how you kind of do that in your own um, teaching. It, it really depends uh, on, on the scale of magnitude, the length and time that the students are able to commit. Um, and also discipline, the, what which department they're involved in, their backgrounds are, so their strengths. What I do recommend in, in this short period of time, it's, it sounds like a curriculum discussion that would require a couple of weeks to really nail it down. But just in a, in, in a, in, in a nutshell, I feel like it needs to be very specific. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can't be just the word like sustainability or climate change. Uh, it just needs to be specific enough, but it, it needs to be a research oriented. Mm -hmm. And so that the research information and the data one collects through whatever portal, that can become the basis for academic, also artistic, creative output. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of those three pillars, I believe. Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely what we try to get to. I think um, part of it maybe is helping students to think through what uh, like what specificity sort of means in a given context um, and maybe getting down to those really specific questions. Um, so I guess I'm sort of curious about maybe more process based um, ways of getting to that specificity. Uh, there's, there's something a professor told me when I was in school that I absolutely hated, but I'll never forget it. Uh, and that is that design is what you can accomplish by the deadline. Right, it's kind of a double edged sword because it means that maybe you can't do as much as you wanted to do for this like grand idea for your project. But on the other side of that, personally, if I didn't have a deadline, I would never finish my project. Right. So it gives you kind of a scope, I think, uh, like Tetsu is suggesting. I also well, like to remind students that they can always pursue a different project in the future. Like if they encounter an idea that they want to explore, but they know they can't fit in the time frame, that can become a new project or even a future iteration of the project they're working on. Yeah, definitely. Nancy, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I coordinate this thing called Sustainability Coalition at Pratt. And since you are Pratt, we can do this kind of cross-pollination in a little bit more in detail. Mm -hmm. Happy to have you over and we can have that kind of a chat amongst everybody because uh, mm -hmm. it, it has faculty, admin, a staff, a students, even alum, mm -hmm. and also local organizations so that we could powwow that. Yeah, that would be great. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you for joining. And Nancy, I just I have to add my two cents here because as you mentioned, this is a, a problem we always see. Um, and you know, a bit of advice that I think Kat and I tend to offer is, um, you know, choose something that is special to you or something that you care about, right? So um, we, we use the phrase morals and then metrics. So start with like, understanding what what you care most about right sustainability is this big problem and it's it get really it gets really scary and you know um i think when when folks can start to decide where they want to spend their efforts and they can choose the hill they want to die on so to speak um that that tends to help our students focus at least great thank you <laughs> We have two questions. Sharon, do you want to join us? I'm here. Hi guys. Oh, okay. Can you see me? Yeah. So you're asking about uh, practical impl implementation. Yeah, uh, I very much like the master's program I just finished, but it was more theoretical than practical. 
And as I go out into the world uh, to either uh, take the, the principles of sustainability and circularity and my desire, my, my mission now is to create a circular text, waste, textile waste industry in New York City um, because we have more of it than anyone. Um, and, but putting theory into practice, if I, while I'm doing this passion project, in order to support myself, it would be great to be able to be a, um, a consultant. But there are skills between uh, theory and practice. And I'm wondering if, if this program has some of those practicality lessons um, to really make you feel confident if you're going to go out in the world and help uh, an industry or an individual company uh, change the way they do business, um, analyzing their business uh, properly uh, with the best know-how that we have now, um, and making recommendations like what Daniel does about for materials that they should switch to. Um, is, is that information covered in this certificate? Well, um, we're, we're definitely uh, uh, more about a crash course on the design courses. Um, uh, we do, um, we, we don't function like a, a MBA type of an approach, but for example, in my biomimicry class, um, every presentation will include uh, some sort of a business model, whether it's circular or local, but uh, that's part of the requirement to discuss, not just the idea and the, sol the solution to a design challenge, but at the same time, how would it influence the community at large? Or how would it, um, how would the local uh, ben economy benefit? What is the industrial commerce and economy surrounding that solution, material, life cycle thinking? So, uh, in, in that sense, we we push in, in my class anyway. We not only design, but we integrate that part of thinking. But it's definitely it's difficult to include in the ten week package uh, per course. But okay. yes, yeah, the the business side of things, creating a pragmatic, practical input uh, uh, from the design and the conceptual is it is critical. So you do you personally do some consultation outside in. In, in business, in various industries, correct? Right, so fashion is different from interior and architecture. And is there is there a program like, uh, or organization like Passive House uh, or LEED criteria, some something, a certification um, process in the fashion industry? And if it doesn't exist, that's a really great niche to open it up. It would be nice to come back to school and do that at Pratt and or, or even create that kind of a system and in, in, in the and in, in the in the fashion business in general I mean there are various certifications that companies that, have that but like yeah. a, as a part of a local New York City type of I don't know no I I understand and that's part of what I'm trying to do in yeah. this now um, because all the waste we have if we can take that out of the uh, municipal solid waste and turn it back into raw materials and re reestablish uh, more reshore more of the, the production for fashion. I certainly have all of that in my background as a designer coming out of Pratt and having worked in the industry for decades now. Um, but some of those translation pieces from theory to practice, um, especially when it's a consulting uh, area you know, how to analyze someone's business for the materials they're using and making sure that if you're rec recommending something that you're avoiding those um, those unintended consequences, um, that you're putting all the design thinking behind it, but then you have some sort of assurance that you're, you're steering a company in the right direction or for myself that I'm, I'm choosing the best uh, textile innovators for textile to textile recycling chemistry, basically. I think we, we believe our certificate is more of a crash course in a conduit 
for each individual's professional or in between collegiate uh, mind going to graduate or PhD to help nurture and uh, um, uh, foster a, a portfolio making so that they could jump, make that bridge across. So we are that conduit. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Good luck with your uh, thing. Thanks, I'd love to come back to school and teach a class. <laughs> But you know, competition and things, uh, it's another place for you to, to, not for you, but for students uh, or anybody who is interested in app potential applicants to, to take that as a way of being able to get your design idea realized in a, in a practical world. Right. You know, when you win it, like for example, I think uh, Julia, maybe you can talk about it. I think winning that the bio design competition gave you an opportunity of wings to fly even further, higher. Um, I, I did want to add, actually, uh, I've had a student or two reach out recently for recommendations to business programs for their future uh, education. So they're looking to, you know, now that they have a sense of some of these sustainable design ideas they would like to implement in their work, they want to make sure that they can build a sustainable business. And we don't necessarily delve into too much detail in the like economic sustainability side of things or like how to run a startup. Um, if that's kind of what you're asking in terms of practicality. So, you know, we, we have helped students to get to that point, but we don't necessarily provide, um, you know, business uh, advice. Uh, and I understand that. And I think personally, I think that's one of the things missing in uh, arts education, uh, that we have beautiful artistic visions and so much creativity, but then taking that, especially when you're talking about applying sustainability to all of it, taking that and making the business case for it, because otherwise you may very well get stuck in the water, stuck in the mud, because if you can't, if you're selling it to, to business um, and not just as an artistic endeavor, you need to justify the expense that's going to be involved in doing things sustainably. That's what they look for. Definitely. I mean, I'll jump in really quickly um, off of what Tatsu was mentioning is that I was able for one of my projects, I was able to create prototypes um, and around that at, or through that process, kind of look into that life cycle analysis and kind of sketch out a system solution to repurpose waste. Um, and prototyping really, really helped. So you can get um, kind of support in that route and start doing your own like just like micro testing or experimentation. Um, so it's a really kind of great space to experiment um, both on the business side and both in on the practical side. You'll get those um, like base tools. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question. Um, were there any others? I'm not seeing anybody pipe up in the chat, but maybe someone wants to raise their hand. Uh, I'm wondering, maybe we can stop sharing the screen for now um, uh, so that we can see people a little bit better. Thank you. And I'm happy to add those links uh, that were on that thank you slide. I can put that in the chat room. So feel free to either unmute or raise your physical or iconic hand. We're happy to have you join us in this really meaningful topic today. Thank you, Danielle, for joining us. I have a question. Um, I was, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. I was wondering, so I understand you guys have the sustainability uh, certificate and I'm wondering how much you guys integrate these practices with, with your other programs. I'm looking into the masters of industrial design currently i'm at cca for industrial design but it doesn't really integrate a lot of sustainability so i'm wondering if you guys do that at prep um 
Um, I, you know, Dan actually got his industrial design uh, degree from from that department. Um, I I can I can share that um, our program we don't uh, necessarily work together yet. Um, that has not been established, but um, we have had other students join us from other schools. They are, I think, in most of these cases, they were actually undergrad students. Um, join us um, for a semester because they felt like their sustainability education wasn't necessarily being addressed. So they supplemented their undergrad education with a certificate program with us. So that is something that's happened, um, but it, it's sort of, uh, it, it's not something that uh, we've done yet. And I can just, uh, this is Carolyn Schaefer from the Pratt Sustainability Center speaking. Um, I can just pipe in specifically about the Pratt, the Pratt Industrial Design Graduate Program if I am understanding the question correctly. Um, so as of a couple of years ago, actually, um, there's another professor at Pratt, his name is Frank Molero, and he's amazing, but he teaches a sustainability and production course that's now a requirement for the graduate MID program. Um, so that is great, meaning that all students have to take it and it's an amazing class. Thank you, Carolyn. It should be noted that Frank actually helped us to create the curriculum for this course. So uh, for, for, sorry, for our uh, process of materials course. So um, what you will learn with him um, um, will be pretty equivalent to what you will learn um, here in the certificate program, at least on that topic. And I also um, collaborate with um, several faculty members from the industrial Desi design department. Um, and and I, <clears throat> I know that uh, they are very committed um, to sustainable design as well. Um, you know, without being to provide more details, uh, it looks like they're on the right track. Pratt has uh, many different schools, uh, but somehow we, we cross pollinate pretty well um, and, and more and more so now that the, each the faculty, is, you know, joins and attends the reviews for a uh, certificate program and vice versa. So we have a lot of cross pollinations happening. So uh, it, it's not in, in the contract per se, but the professors and, 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 and um, uh, professors that are teaching at different schools uh, within the Pratt Institute ended up coming over to do a guest lecture or talking about life cycle for Frank, for example, and vice versa. Sometimes the, the, the students um, uh, um, from a different school end up taking our class while they're pursuing a degree program. So there, you know, I think it's case by case. Different different school has a different ways, but Pratt is pretty pretty well woven. I I, I would like to think, right, Carolyn, right, Joelle. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, uh, I I. We're working on it also. Y yes, I I just feel really grateful and and proud to be part of Pratt. Um, you know when. When we have these meetings at the Sustainable Coalition at Pratt, we, we get a chance to meet, uh, you know, faculty, staff, and students, uh, and it's it, it's really rewarding to see the level of engagement. And the result of it is actually this, you know, one of the results is this week. Please uh, engage in this week's activities from uh, Pratt Earth Action Week. And, and you'll, you'll see for yourself that uh, Pratt Institute is really committed, highly committed to sustainable design. Can I chime in again? Um, I wanted to know if the, if the Sustainability Center, if your, your program has organized um, either interested alum or uh, alumni working in sustainability in any field, uh, like a database for us or many conferences where we can discuss and collaborate. Uh, that is a large part of sustainability and circularity is collaborating. Um, it would be interesting, I think, to have uh, alumni in there organized. It may, it may be a survey that you have to send out, but. 
Yeah, Sharon, I think that's a wonderful idea. We we had planned actually last year um, during what was formerly called Green Week and is now called Pratt Earth Action Week. Um, we'd actually uh, created sort of an alumni event, but because the pandemic happened sort of right as we were about to have this thing, we um, sort of scrapped all of those events, but but um, it's it's been on our minds and it's certainly something that we want to focus on in the future because we do know that so many alum are out there in the field working and to speak to um, the complexities of actually applying this, um, you know, as you were saying earlier, you know, understanding how it becomes applicable and compelling for the business world. And it's sort of, uh, you know, you leave Pratt with these sort of rose colored glasses and then you get into the real world and and it's it's a little bit more complicated. So yeah, I would love to, I would love to help coordinate and potentially we can sort of have you um, participate in that coordination if you're interested. Yes. Awesome, cool. Definitely. Definitely. The, the school's gotten so much better about alumni uh, communication. Um, yeah, I would love to continue that that path, especially along sustainability, because I think the more Pratt becomes known for its approach to to this, you know, current problem, um, and the less than ten years we have to the climate scientists, you know, doomsdays, um, the 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 stronger we'll all be, the stronger our degrees will be, and perhaps more collaboration will occur with alum and students and internships and all the kinds of things we could do. Great. Um, Monica, you have a question or comment for us? Uh, it's just a question. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm calling from Hamburg. So it's uh, after midnight. It's almost 1 a.m. So um, the question is, would you accept um, alumni from other comparable programs as well? I think that could be very interesting for the cross fertilization as well. I mean, in, in concrete, um, I'm a 2016 graduate uh, at FIT, Sustainable, Deve Sustainable uh, Design. And also, I'm holding a PhD in uh, environmental economics. I think that that would be a great addition. I would love to um, to incorporate other people. And I've um, provided my email address in the chat for anyone who's interested. Okay. We welcome all kinds of people. <laughs> we don't, ex we don't ex you know. No, but uh, I mean the, the the issue was always the um, Pratt alumni all the time. That's what I'm ask, asking, just to verify. Thank you. We always invite people of all different types, and it, it there might you know it, it doesn't have to be a Pratt alum only to do so. I mean, I think it would be it would be great to be able to share as much as we can because it's we're, we're not trying to be siloed here. You know, it's such a big issues that we have to do it. We, we can't do it all by ourselves. More hands that we hold, the better. We're very inclusive that way. It's 6.45, Joelle. Okay. Is, I'm okay going on a, a one more or two more, but I just don't want to hold up the... Um, uh, thank you, Tetsu, and thank you, everyone. Um, are there further comments or questions? Because if it seems like we are complete with today, um, we don't have to stay until seven. Um, and on my end, I'm uh, I'm interested in, in getting a sense if there's anyone who is contemplating the idea of joining us on this certificate program in sustainable design at Pratt. Um, you know, it would be nice to know. All right, Melissa. I see you almost. Well, I see your iconic thumb up. <laughs> okay, Erica Chapman, I see you, your thumb up. Very nice. So you know how to join us uh, or at least inquire. I'm gonna, uh, I think Kat already did that. 
right the pro study at prat.edu and i also provided my email if you have further questions oh good xuan xu we also see your thumb up thank you so much very good from my understanding it looks like on the website you just sign up for the course and you pay for it and then that's it yes it's pretty straightforward very simple okay. good thank you so, um, you know, I think that if we are complete for tonight, let me just really thank, uh, first of all, our wonderful program faculty, uh, Tetsu, Kat, and Dan, uh, really, really wonderful and inspiring as always, and Julia for coming. Uh, really congratulations, Julia, on your wonderful success. Very, very meaningful and inspiring to all of us. Um, it's really a joy um, to, you know, to be involved in, in this. I, I think we're all believers here. Uh, so I'm just wishing everyone well, and you know how to contact us if you have further comments or questions. And otherwise, please stay safe, be well, and hopefully get vaccinated if not done already. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Joelle. Thank you all. Thank you.